Dawn Marsden, and the presentation today is uh, EWE, Indigenous Knowledge Applications for Space Development and Earth System Governance. It's actually uh, a combination of projects that I've been involved with, and uh, it's, it's been an organic process, um, and uh, it kind of came out of the blue, so I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, I want to acknowledge the, the people of this territory, Treaty 4 peoples, and um, the organizers and, and uh, supporters of this showcase. Uh, and just let you know a little bit about myself. I'm Anishinaabek and, and French from the Mississaugas of Scugog Island. And um, I'm a newcomer to this territory. I've been here for a year and a half. Um, so I, I'm just feeling my way around and getting to know everybody and, and everything. So uh, this is a picture of my dad. Um, he, uh, he's been involved in, in uh, some ceremony and, and um, events. I look up to him a lot. Uh, my motivations, my Indigenous knowledge motivations for these projects uh, were um, around my, my growing concern and global concern around social and environmental issues um, and also my um, uh, listening to elders talk about the seven fires prophecy and that we're entering a, a, a period of time of great change and that, it, that it's time now to uh, share Indigenous knowledge for um, the betterment of our, our world. Um, also, I, f I feel a moral imperative to be part of the solution to transform our world, and uh, ex existential imperative, of course, uh, to protect and sustain life. Uh, my background's in Indigenous health. And uh, I have great faith in the wisdom of Indigenous knowledge. Um, a lot of times it, it tends to get discounted um, as literature, as quaint, um, and uh, I, I believe that the, the wisdom of, of the elders is as applicable today to today's issues as, as it was um, over many generations. Uh, my space motivations. Uh, until the last year, this was kind of a, a secret part of me. <laughs> um, I'm a Trekkie. I saw the moon landing, um, and I wrote, read Jules Verne. Uh, I listened to Star Nation stories. Um, in uh, 2005, I was one of 15 people to get a scholarship um, in Canada to go to the International Space Uni University um, summer camp. And what they were discussing was near-Earth objects. And I had to choose between finishing my dissertation and, and handing it in or going to this camp. Um, it was a really hard decision. Um, I've also been keeping tabs on space development. So I've been watching as um, the International Treaty on Space has been developed. Um, there's all kinds of documents available at the UN um, uh, Organization of Outer Space Activities, I think, or agents. Um, there's all kinds of uh, initiatives taking place. There's, there's a real interest in uh, learning how to recapture uh, asteroids and, and mine asteroids. There's, there's interest in, uh, I think there's three projects at least that are interested in uh, interstellar uh, space starship um, travel, so there's um, there's a space race going on. So people are trying to design the systems necessary to travel uh, interstellar, as well as within the, so the, uh, the uh, solar system here. Um, Mars, of course, being one of the, the main focuses. There's uh, goals to settle settle Mars, uh, Mars One. There's a Mars Settlement Project. There's um, uh, there's also there's interest around the world. People are sending their satellites over there. Um, and uh, their, their equipment over there. There's uh, new technology and propulsion. Um, they're just trying to put the brakes on plasma, plasma drive that can uh, get to the moon in two hours and Mars in two weeks. So they just have to figure out how to slow it down. Um, and then they'll be, uh, we'll be tourists for, for Mars. Um, so my concern, my interest, and uh, the essay that I wrote for the scholarship was was around um, colonization. So are we going to do things the same way? Uh, are we going to colonize and, and um, destroy environments the same way that we have on Earth? Um, and so that's kind of a running theme throughout my work. And um, so just move on here. So my research questions um, came out of initially an article abstract that I submitted uh, to Kim Anderson. There's a book coming out on indigenous mothering. And um, so my, 
I've always wanted to discuss um, how do you teach self-determination to your children. And um, it sounds easy, but once you start trying to discuss it, it's like, well, which, which values are important? Which activities are important? And um, I, I tried for about six months to, tr to write, and um, nothing was happening. And then I saw this, this uh, call for papers to the 100 years uh, uh, Starship Society, um, which is one of the interstellar groups. And uh, they have moved on from uh, engineering. Um, they realized that they needed to add a social component. You know, if we're going to be traveling interstellar, uh, intergenerationally, then we need to um, be able to design social systems that are going to be environmentally sustainable and socially cohesive over a long term. And so for me, that was a no-brainer. It's like, wow, well, indigenous people have this knowledge. And, uh, and so it made it easier for me to try and um, uh, come up with a, a list of the principles that I learned from various elders about, you know, how do you keep, keep uh, the social cohesion? How do you live respectfully with the earth uh, and with the other species? All those good relationship stories. And um, so I developed a, a quick, a quick, uh, uh, model based on my my reflection. So really, this is this is uh, um, I'm not representing anybody or anybody's uh, particular culture. Most of the teachings are from uh, Anishinaabek teachings. Um, I've done uh, I've sat in a lot of moon lodges and um, I've gone to medicine wheels and ceremony and um, so a lot of these teachings come from those those places. And. Um, so I developed a paper called Indigenous Principles for Starship Citizen Handbook. So it made it, made it really focused way of thinking about which principles are key to sustainability socially and environmentally. So again, just reflections on my own life. And so there's a bit of a, a synthesis between my academic background and my, my, the traditional teachings that I've learned. So I've kind of um, tried to communicate so this was a tra translation exercise, trying to translate to, to uh, hundreds of mostly engineers and um, uh, hardcore scientists, physicists. Um, so I had to try and use whatever language I could. And so the language, my, my background is environmental studies. So um, I, I have a systems approach, uh, a systems way of thinking about things. <coughs> so what is indigenous um, for me? It's about multi-millennial co-adaption of species within a specific bioregion. So that includes, that includes us. You know, all around the world, um, people learn to live with spe within specific environments and with, with other relations, other species in the environment. And um, that our culture is adapted to, to be in good relationship. Because when we weren't in good relationship, then that had direct impacts on our, our lives. So indigenous, indigenous systems are environmentally embedded. It's one of the key, key concepts. Um, and, our, and this is just another model of, of how um, principles and practices arise. So it comes from direct experience over long periods of time. So um, my argument over to the 100-year um, the starship community was that um, there's, this, there's this attempt to try and redesign systems based on technology uh, based on military systems, naval systems, and um, and in my mind, you know, we're just heading for the same kind of situation that we have now. Um, why not look at the tried and true experience of Indigenous people? Uh, and I, f I figured I figured I put a list together of the parallels between Indigenous communities and um, and a starship. So there's very very many similarities. You're, you're bounded environmentally. Um, uh, you, you need time-tested and reliable systems. You need to conserve your resources. Um, if there's social issues, exile is, is tantamount to death. Um, you need diverse skills, skill sets. And uh, um, your ship becomes like your, your mother, like Mother Earth. So um, to focus citizenship, um, there has to be some kind of goals. What are your, what are your citizenship goals? And uh, for me, it, it seemed clear that it was to, to continue the social cohesion, maintain social cohesion, and environmental sustainability. Those are two major ones. And 
um, how how that was done, you know, in a lot of indigenous communities was was through equity, through self determination, um, and fulfillment of of per personal aptitudes and, and gifts, and supporting that within a community setting, and um, maintaining environmental sustainability through healthy and survivable systems. So um, so we take care of all those systems: water, um, sewage, wastes, uh, in a way that's sustainable. And Indigenous Frameworks for Environmentally Embedded Holistic Egalitarianism. So that's, that's the short title for, for the principles that, that I um, pulled together. And again, this comes from direct experience. So natural law and intergenerational learning leads to environmentally embedded, adapted, adaptive, cohesive, responsive, and resilient social systems. So um, there are four major areas. And one of them uh, was that it all begins with our ways of knowing, knowing again, embedded in the earth, um, and our spiritual relationship to, the, to reality. You know, what kind of concepts do we have that reinforce our relationship um, and reinforce that understanding? And also uh, an understanding of interconnectedness. Um, you know, physics is, is already there, you know, with the quantum mechanics and, and uh, ex you know, our, um, the Heisenberg's principle and our ability to influence matter. Um, and then the environment, environmental base. So we need to be always conscious that we are um, in constant relationship with the environment, earth, water, all the plants and, and foods that we eat. Um, on the right there is um, personal development. So what kind of things happen in indigenous communities? Well, there's, there's uh, an acknowledgement of, of gifts. I've heard lots of stories of people, um, you know, uh, recognizing the gifts of the children, sometimes before they're born, and saying, this person will be really good at this. Let's support and nurture this person. Um, and so uh, a child is nurtured to become self-determining through the years by um, teaching them self-sufficiency, to care for themselves, to contribute to the community. And um, one way of doing that is through apprenticeship with other people. So people follow their dreams, their goals, their visions, and they work with the people that are, um, that are um, elders in those areas who have the knowledge. And then we go into uh, a, a community resilience. So community resilience in indigenous communities, um, it starts with food. Um, I think food is really central. If we can promote one thing, it's, it's the centrality and um, mutual collaboration in, in uh, developing food systems. So um, hunters and fishers and gatherers and farmers. Um, uh, in a starship setting, it would be slightly different. Um, and, um, and then as people, as people um, actually, I'm going to move on a little bit because I have some pictures for everything. So there's many things that come from communal food situations. And, and if there's one thing that I noticed, um, it's that uh, there's a lot of gatherings, a lot of uh, community gatherings where people come and they, they share food and they share teachings and they, they talk about what's important to the community, um, uh, grieve together. Uh, there's all kinds of things that go on um, in the, the preparation of food and the sharing of food. And I think it's key to sustainability and social cohesion. Um, another one is relationships. Again, back to those, those core principles that we're all connected, that everyone is uh, sacred, a part of the sacred creation, um, and that we have to um, work with respect um, of each person um, and every, every species that's in our, in our universe. Um, and that includes uh, asking permission, you know, for touching and, and for all kinds of things, um, and expressing gratitude uh, over long term. Another, what, another principle that I, I keep hearing about is, is the trade networks. There's a lot of trade networks, and, and it was about free trade. And these free trade, the trade wasn't, wasn't always about just um, acquiring goods or food. Um, it was also about developing trust and uh, relationships between nations, between communities, between families. Um, people would, you know, get married. They would uh, form long-term um, relationships. Uh, for collaboration, um, and 
you know, nowadays we have powwows, uh, we have community gatherings and conferences. Um, those are just extensions of, of what we had before. Um, restorative justice is another principle that, that I, I hear about a lot. Um, the idea that, uh, you know, if, if relationships aren't balanced, you know, if there's an imbalance and people are feeling wronged, then, then you need to get everybody in the same room to address those issues. And um, people need to voice, you know, their, their perspective on what happened. And then the people who have been, been wronged, um, you know, they can talk about, you know, what, what they would like to see happen and then um, come to agreement. And sometimes there's peacekeepers and moderators that, that help that process, elders. Um, and um, it's a way of, of including everybody in the development of the, the community and, and the cohesion of the community. So a person who makes a mistake isn't banned for life, isn't ostracized for life, isn't, uh, the stigma isn't with them for life. Um, they they uh, resolve those issues in good relationship. <coughs> Another one is public rites of passage. So celebration of all those, those life events. Um, you know, when a, a young, young boy, you know, has his first hunt and he shares his kill, that's, that's a, a time for celebration. Um, when a person comes of age, puberty rites, uh, a young woman, you know, they transform. Sometimes they, they take on new names. Those are times to celebrate. Um, uh, adoptions, uh, exiles, um, those happen in the past too. Um, rebirth. If somebody goes through a major illness um, and comes back, they've survived against all odds. Uh, they've gone on a journey and they've returned. Um, it's like a rebirth and it's a welcome back um, to the community. Um, marriage um, and major contributions. People who have, have gone out of their way to be good leaders and supporters of the community. And of course, death. Um, mourning together, grieving together and, um, and celebrating all those, those uh, accomplishments in life. <clears throat> Another, um, into the governance section, um, we, uh, there's circle talk, which, which is essentially inclusiveness in um, every decision that's going on in the community. So as people acquire competence in, in different realms, um, they have more say uh, and they, they begin to um, participate. You know, sometimes there, you, you'll see little kids hanging out with the elders and they're there, they're listening, they're learning. And uh, eventually, you know, sometimes they'll be asked, well, what do you think? What are the young people saying? And so there's a place for, for young people to have voice and, and women um, to have voices and men to have voices and, um, and then elders. And it's a way of, of making every decision very, very strong because you, you look at every angle that anybody could come up with. <coughs> and uh, consensus, this is a hard one for, for a lot of people. But it's that deliberation about all the different issues. Um, and if, if it seems like everybody's, um, you know, on board with a, a certain decision, people can step back and say, okay, I, I understand that you guys want to go in this direction. Um, I'm going to move back um, and um, I don't want any part of it. I'm not going to contribute family resources um, and neither will I accept any of the consequences. So, but go ahead, you know, you do your thing. And, um, uh, this, this is actually a really neat picture. It's f way back from my undergrad days, and I can't remember, but it's a, it's a Haudenosaunee, uh, it's a circle of wampum. And um, what I was told then was that um, people held wampum for their families. And so when they represented those people, they would take that wampum, those wampum beads, those strings of beads, and they would take them to a council, a council meeting, and they would lay them out in a circle like this, so that you knew exactly who was there. You knew who, who this, this gathering, what the decisions, the decisions that were being made, um, who they represented. And uh, people would, would see this. It was a physical representation of who was being represented. And um, again, this concept of leadership from below. So um, nowadays we have very hierarchical, top-down si systems of, of governance. And um, in, in uh, indigenous teachings, it was always about leadership from below. So we have this, this um, circle talk, we have this consensual decision making. Um, so then when you decide, okay, um, in Ojibwe territory it was Pontiacs, you know, we need somebody to, to lead this move, we're going to move this camp. Um, this person is the most experienced, 
the best person for the job. The other one says, yeah, yeah, okay, we agree, this person is good. So that person becomes the leader and they speak, you know, on behalf of this move. Um, but it's temporary. So you have a Pontiac for this, a Pontiac for that. Uh, so leadership is very specific. So people can't go out of their jurisdiction. You know, I've been, I've been asked to do this. What about this? Well, I have to go back to the community and ask. So it's a, it's a different form of leadership. Um, and uh, you know what, I've had conversations, some people consider this um, anarchy, but it's actually a very, very strict system. Um, and I think it needs to be considered. So um, when I did the presentation at, in Houston, uh, one of the biggest challenges was, can these principles be taught cross-culturally? Can they be taught to uh, astronauts from diverse groups? Um, so I'm working with a, a, a group, uh, an educator, space education group, it's called SPACE. Um, they're very interested in um, having some modules so that uh, astronauts can learn. But um, I feel like I've, I got ahead of myself because these are just reflections on what I've learned in my lifetime. And I really need to go out and do more research and work with people who know more than me. <laughs> um, many different people because um, as soon as you start talking about sharing these principles, um, especially, um, I'll talk a bit later, with uh, uh, UN developments and things like that, then you have to be, you have to have people who are well versed in, um, and ideally bicultural. So, you know, they have a really strong understanding of restorative justice, they have a really strong understanding of um, community food systems, they have, you know, in all these different areas. So, um, one, one area of research that I'd like to get into, um, I'm not sure how yet, but uh, is to do simulation because right now there's all kinds of simulations going on uh, for Mars, Mars settlements, um, but I haven't seen anything yet ab around social systems. It's all about um, just throw everybody in this room and now they've got to survive off, off these rations and let's see what's hap what happens. So it's, it, there's some sophistication, there's more, more um, you know, astrobiological and astropsychology uh, papers out there, um, but I haven't seen any, th any models yet. Um, so I've, uh, I also put in another abstract um, with the UN Earth Go uh, System Governance Conference coming up in Norwich in July. And so that's my, my deadline. If I'm going to work with people, I have to work with them uh, before July. And um, it's kind of a very short time frame. And um, so the next step is how do you get from these ideal situations, indigenous communities, um, socially cohesive, environmentally embedded, how do you transform our existing systems on Earth today to, into those kind of systems? And how do you do that? Um, of course, one of the biggest critiques is, well, we can't go back, but we can still learn. We can still learn and apply these ideas. Um, I'm working with John Carter McKnight. Um, he's working with the uh, European Union on um, our austerity future. So they're talking about social design. Um, and so he's very interested because uh, he, he talks about how the um, military model just doesn't work if we're going to be working into the future. Um, you know, there's all these documents at the international level about how we need to start um, penalizing and rationing people and, um, you know, it sounds like a concentration camp version of uh, the future. <coughs> I think we're, we can do better than that. So um, my, my hypothesis is we can transform our current societies by uh, reconciling multi-level multi relationships, devolution to bioregionally self-determining communities and healing intergenerational trauma. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, we have the capacity, the resources and the technology to do it and the examples. Um, so again, an invitation, uh, anybody who's interested in, in working with me, um, we need people from diverse uh, backgrounds and skill sets to um, try and theorize around uh, what's out there already, what kind of models are there. I really like this statement by Perry Belgard. He did a talk uh, a few days ago up in Saska uh, Saskatoon. He says, the economy is 100% owned subsidiary of the environment. And that's, that's such a true statement and it's, it's a really good um, translation device. Um, it translates um, the idea of being embedded in the earth. Uh, Rianne Eisler, she worked in the, uh, the 60s to the 80s um, she did a lot of work looking at archaeology, and um, she took a, a, a woman's look 
at history, all the archaeological digs, and found that a lot of the, the information um, about women's culture had been ignored. And um, uh, uh, Marija Gumbas, too, uh, I believe her name is, uh, she also did work in the same area. And so they started asking, what kind of relationships do we want to have and impart to our children? Um, this is because, I, I added this because these are all uh, examples of um, indigenous philosophies around the world. So within each one of these, these different symbols, there's all kinds of um, holistic concepts that are, that are similar to indigenous principles, primarily because they arose from those territories um, and were relevant to those territories. Um, this one is the uh, uh, Egyptian symbol of Amat, which is that everything is connected, basically, that we're all part of this, this web. Um, the Tree of Life, some of you have may, may have seen that Celtic symbol, uh, yin-yang. Um, and um, this is a, a Buddha symbol, I believe, and for oneness. Down here, uh, even in the Greek roots, this is the temple at Delphi, Know, uh, know yourself, everything in moder moderation. Um, and the symbol in the middle here means unity or oneness. Uh, and of course, uh, the medicine wheel, and this is, a, this is an Aztec symbol. A lot of people think it's Mayan. Um, and uh, of course, a Judaic symbol, the um, tetragrammaton, uh, which symbolizes um, the all. Um, so the idea in, in indigenous systems, because they're embedded and there's this, this dynamic uh, equilibrium going on, is that if you have environmental issues, instabilities, then that's when uh, the community draws together. Okay, we had this you know, mudslide over here. We had, um, you know, our crops have failed. This is when the, the community um, you know, is aware and, and comes together even stronger. So your social cohesion goes up. You know, you adapt to the, the, the environmental change um, or you resolve the environmental change. Maybe you clear the, the creeks. Um, you know, on the west coast they had uh, river guardians. Um, so the key to sustainability in indigenous communities has been the response ability. So the ability to respond to change. Um, and it's about this dynamic equilibrium. So you're always seeking balance um, with your with the, the relations and the lands and the waters around you. So what happened? So we've only, we've only had about uh, five, 6,000 years since um, the, uh, the Kurgan philosophy, which Ran Eisler talks about, um, of male dominance and um, the idea of, it's, it was basically a colonizing mindset. Men have the right to, to go to other territories and dominate. And they had the, man, the technology for it. They had the horse, which revolutionized um, uh, colonization into other territories. Um, and so we, we see a domino effect. We, ha we see an expansion. Um, they're also called the Indo-Europeans. Um, the Kurgans um, is one group of the Indo-Europeans that spread out to, to uh, the Middle East and, and Europe. Um, and there was a colonization of of sedentary, egalitarian, um, primarily ag agrarian settlements. Um, and it ha this happened at the same time. So as, as settlements were becoming more uh, agrarian, moving away from uh, a little bit from permaculture, it was still embedded. Um, and there was all these, these deities, these female deities as well as male deities. Um, so there was a respect for the feminine and a balance in relationships. So um, the indigenous philosophies were still, still existing. Um, but as, as country after country or, or territory after territory was colonized, um, what comes with that colonization is trauma. Um, uh, yeah, Gimbutas, sorry, Marija Gimbutas. Um, she's also involved in that kind of history, history work. So what we have now, um, we have colonial systems all over the world. In the last 200 years in particular, um, most of the colonization of, uh, of indigenous territories has taken place. So um, as you can see from this quote here, uh, in 1800, only 35% of the, er the world's surface was, um, or territories were colonized. And by 1914, 85%. So that's a huge growth um, through colonization of uh, oppression of indigenous people and, and um, 
uh, governance systems and philosophies, worldviews. So now we, what we have here, uh, we have our decision making is corporate backed federal politicians primarily. It's a top down form of governance. Um, our community re resilience is measured through <coughs> property, capacity, and cash um, and, and, and other assets. Uh, our personal development is career based public education, competitive individualism, and our ways of knowing are authoritarian. So people tell us what we should know rather than direct experience. Uh, it's uh, ways of knowing are reductionistic. You know, you need, need to know a little bit of this. You need to study this and compartmentalize all these different things. Uh, it's dualistic, it's competitive, um, and it's very materialistic. So um, uh, for lay people, for, for most of us, material wealth is, is ina inadequately promoted as the cure for individual and so societal ills. So all these things disconnect us from each other, disconnect us from the earth, from the, the food that we eat. Um, you know, if you talk about where the food comes from, some people are just, uh, you know, um, uh, shocked, you know, at the conditions of the, the uh, food species, uh, the plants and the animals. <coughs> so um, I'm hearing several things. So one of the, the critiques that I'm, I'm hearing a lot, um, and uh, if, if we talk to CSIS, they might say that this is uh, domestic <coughs> insurgency. So the idea that we need to let it fall, we need to let um, our, our communities fall, society fall. And um, there's a book that was written by Keith Farnish, Underminers, and this, this uh, model um, talks about how we're disconnected. So the tools of disconnection. And it's kind of an us and them model, which I think is, um, you know, whenever there's an us and them, I think we need to have a conversation because um, it's seldom about us and them. It's about people in different situations um, making decisions that, that um, are too isolated. Um, and so uh, there's, there's a critique that um, people in power, corporation, uh, politicians, schools, um, religions <coughs> are, are doing it to us. Um, and so we need to let it fall and then we can rebuild our social systems. So in, this, in the existing systems, um, the idea is that uh, with increasing instability, we get a decrease in social cohesion. So we're going to get all kinds of, of social instabilities, we're going to get rioting, we're going to get um, uh, 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 you know, destruction of, of corporate institutions, um, occupations, um, and a lot of people are, are pointing at different, different things happening around the globe. Um, there's a new report out. Uh, it's actually not available yet, but uh, it's, it's called the Handy Model. And uh, this is a, a NASA-funded project. And they say that uh, business as usual cannot be sustained and that policy and structural changes are required immediately. And you, you can pick up <coughs> any document that's been written in the last couple years, um, and it's all about stability. Um, and security. How are we going to secure the masses, you know, in the face of uh, climate change, you know, and mass mass um, migrations because of climate change? Um, here's another one. Uh, this is uh, a uh, a British researcher. Uh, one of his um, projections: by 2030, we're going to need to produce 50% more food and energy, and have access to 30% more water. Um, I wanted to bring this in because um, suicide is, is considered an indicator of social integration or lack of social cohesion. And Durkheim talks about um, the suicide rate varies inversely with the integration of, of domestic society. So it's another way of saying the same thing. Um, and, and the quote here by the Aboriginal Healing Foundation is that uh, the social bro breakdown that has resulted from colonization um, you know, is, has led to the same, the same situation. So it's, a, it's an example of um, the destruction of social cohesion. Global suicide rates are, are increasing immensely. It's now the, the leading cause of death for people 15 to 49. Um, that's in a recent publication again, surpassing all cancers, heart disease, um, again, amongst uh, the young population. You can see here, it's, it even surpasses deaths due to war, murder, forces of nature, tsunamis, 
earthquakes. So that's a sign that, our, that it's not working. Um, so evidence for restoring environmentally embedded holistic egalitarian frameworks. Um, Non-materialism. So there's, here's a quote here by, by Kasser. There's evidence that non-materialistic orientation con contributes to psychological well-being. So the more we look outside of us um, out, um, for um, fulfillment of our spirit and our, our heart and our emotions um, and our mind, our mental pursuits, um, the, uh, the more um, our lives can be more fulfilled. And it, it's an antidote to consumer capitalism. Uh, Chandler and Lalonde's work, I think, is groundbreaking and still is groundbreaking. Um, and it suggests that uh, if we have these social factors in place, that there are no suicides. So I'll show you a little slide, the next one here. And what they did, Chandler and Lalonde, was was um, take a look at which factors were present in communities, indigenous communities in BC. And so those that had all these factors present had no suicide. And those um, that had some had some suicides. And so to the point where um, those that had none of the factors present had 400 times the rate of suicide as any of the other groups. So the, the, the factors present and these are, you can kind of relate these to uh, what the elders were saying. You know, we need to ha have self-government. We need to have community self-government. We need to um, we need to have land claims. We need to have control over our lands and waters. Um, we need to have control over our education services, to to have those apprenticeship sit, uh, situations to to um, tailor education to that community. Um, we need to have police and fire services. So we need people in the community who can address issues. Um, we need to have health services, take care of our own. We need to have cultural facilities to pass on these teachings of good relationship. Um, and later in later studies, they, they realized that there was also two other factors, that when you have women in government, that increases your, your social cohesion and reduces your suicide rates um, and child welfare services. So, so taking care of your own children within your community, um, that also reduces so suicide rates. And this is an interesting um, stat. Aboriginal Healing Foundation found that the rate of suicide among Aboriginal elders is the lowest among all age groups and nationalities in Canada. And that, to me, that, that, that creates a link between Indigenous knowledge and those, those ways of living and relating and, um, and social cohesion. There's, there's a, this is a, comes off a PowerPoint um, by Griffin, um, and I have all these, these uh, references, if you like, later. And uh, they, they did case study interviews of 51 elders in three tribal communities, and that's 450,000 acres of territory. And these, the, the tribes in these areas, in the states, they, are, um, they have self-government over their, their forestry, their, their wild rice, maple sugaring, hunting, fishing, herding, farming, and gathering. So they've got control over those resources. And so they're echoing the same thing. You know, the most important thing is that we need to um, preserve our culture, 26% um, there. We need to uh, have good government interactions and relations, not just within the community, but with other neighboring communities. Uh, we need to have ecological integrity. We need to protect our land from contaminants. Um, and um, social justice, 18% uh, there. So when you have those things in place, when you have those cultural teachings in place, suddenly social justice isn't, isn't quite, um, uh, it doesn't become as much as, of an issue. And then you see at here that 8% um, for economic viability. So if you have a strong social system where people assist each other and contribute, then um, you're less reliant on, on uh, cash society. <coughs> So the goal, transform market-centered societies into earth-centered societies. Um, so let it fall, talked about that a little bit. There's all kinds of documents out there right now. Um, armed conflict is on the rise. 66% of armed fatalities are in non-war-torn um, countries. So that kind of tells you something. The social cohesion is, is dissolving globally. Um, this uh, quote by Montcharel, 
rise and, and collapse of, of, of um, empires is uh, it happens throughout history and in particular um, you know since the the Indo-European this this uh, this mindset this world view of domination and oppression which is very short um, in the, the history of humankind um, uh, it's it's resulted in in this disruption so we have a rise and fall of this dominant system okay we're we're in charge now um, you know after time there's the social cohesion and and um, uh, falls apart because you know there's in a, a society where you have, it's stratified you always have people who are discontent um, and eventually it falls apart um, and this happens you can see this in history over and over again um, so again this is Farnish in his book um, he's uh, suggesting that the only way to prevent global ecological collapse is to um, not only uh, let let humanity and societies fall, civilization fall, but to, to be um, active in that. <coughs> um, so this is option two. Rather than let it fall, we need to, we need to have better control over um, the earth systems, over people. Um, so it's, a, it's an even more oppressive situation. We need to uh, move from informing and advising you know, everybody has goodwill, everybody's trying to do good things, um, to penalizing, so criminalizing um, relationships. And there's a lot of good ideas in those, those, um, this document. This one in particular, KPMG International, is uh, focused on uh, tax and audits. Um, so they provide those kind of services. Um, so theirs is more of a, um, comes from that, that perspective. So um, they're promoting restricting or rationing um, and phasing out higher energy consuming technology. Some of their ideas are great. Uh, prohibiting non-biodegradable bags. And you'll see this a lot in this, the technocracy solution is lists of things um, that we must do or not do. Um, and uh, Mont Charay, the other author, he, he warns that technological change can raise the efficiency of resource use, but may actually increase the per capita resource um, consumption and the scale of resource extraction. So now we're, we're a, a bigger machine, more efficient machine, um, but eventually it still leads to environmental degradation um, and destruction. So the third option um, that I mentioned earlier was to decentralize and devolve control capacity and resources to a regional and community level. So um, you have communities that are in control of their lands and resources in that territory, in the region. Um, uh, so again, KPMG, if we flip their statement, governments may need to shift from banning and penalizing, um, you know, which is being promoted now, to informing and advising. And um, how we do that, uh, David Suzuki and Faisal Mula, Director General in Ontario and Northern Canada, um, they recommend the same thing. We need a stronger municipal infrastructure. So in a devolved system, uh, according to World Bank, local governments have clear and legally recognized geographical boundaries over which they exercise authority and within which they perform public functions. So um, this uh, uh, governance system where you, you have people discussing, you know, like, ah, I you know, went to this creek and there's this happening and I, you know, the, our water source, this is happening. Um, people have intimate knowledge of their, their environment. So they, ha they have the knowledge to make the decisions that affect that area. So their food sources, their water sources, um, you know, what do they do with their, their wastes and um, how do they control their wastes? Um, and um, so the more control a, a, a region has or a community has, um, the more we are responsive to the environment and to each other. So here's a couple examples. Um, Reconciliation of domestic treaty relationships, title and interests. So we, we see through the RCAP, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, that uh, reconciliation of, of all these, these uh, legal um, relationships, um, if we resolve those, those relationships, um, then we can have a, a clearer understanding and clearer control over or local resources. Um, another one, um, self-determination. Since 1996, there's been... Uh, 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 official support of self-determination 
And, um, and uh, we have one example, the devolution to territories, the uh, BC tripartite framework agreement on First Nations health governance. So they're, they are taking control of their, their health, health services and their health resources um, so that they can, they can be more responsive to the health needs of the Indigenous people in BC. That's one example. Northwest Territories Lands and Resources uh, Devolution Agreement uh, between the Government of Canada, the, um, the Government of Northwest Territories and Aboriginal Parties. So you've got um, um, all these, these bureaucratic issues, all these legalities these, that uh, people have ignored for years and transgressed for years. Um, they're all laid out on paper. Okay, you guys have, you now have control of your lands and resources in this area. Um, and if there's, uh, at this point, it's, they talk about revenue sharing. So who gets the funds um, um, and who gets to decide Everybody gets to decide in this situation, and there's people who have diverse rights according to their treaties and um, uh, prior agreements. So the methodology is to address those those resource control imbalances. Um, Suzuki and Mula again, they they talked about how municipalities only receive about eight percent back from taxes that are collected, and yet are responsible for sixty percent of the infrastructure. So this is an imbalance. 80% um, of the, the Canadian population live in urban areas, 50% um, globally. So um, yet they don't have the, the funds for the infrastructure. Um, we have a top-heavy uh, country, essentially. So it burdens citizens with cost recovery. You know, we need to raise your taxes. Um, uh, in Regina here, you know, suddenly we've got recycling. Now it's, you know, $90 um, added to your... your uh, your year, um, you know, uh, in other places there's composting, and so there's different ways of, of addressing that. But the more uh, the burdens placed on on community members, um, the less responsibility, um, you know, is is called for by by those in charge of the the funds, basically. So um, one of the ideas is is to maintain urbanization. So we want to have these these central uh, habitats for people but not only do we want to have those central habitats we want people to live and work in those habitats we don't want people commuting three hours so you've got transportation issues we, we want people to produce in those those communities um, we don't want to have this long-distance transportation um, issues and, and pollutants um, we want to have public transit that's more environmentally sustainable um, we want local education for local needs local justice. Um, initial objectives, shift taxes to municipalities, bioregions, promote work where you live and job swap programs, um, you know, like, kind of like those dating, dating sites. <laughs> um, improve green transit. Uh, um, and a lot of these are, are reflections on, um, you know, what elders have said. You know, like we, um, you know, we used to walk. We used to walk everywhere. You know, and we used to meet everybody. We talked to people. Um, it's a way of slowing down your relationships and, and being more present uh, in your relationships. Um, support eco-friendly building, manufacturing technology. 100% um, pollutant recapture and restoration. Um, local participatory food systems. Again, that, that develops community, social cohesion. Um, and uh, knowledge sharing about, about the local environment. Uh, eliminate interest. Um, heard this before. Uh, interest in our society uh, develops financial entrapment, um, which reduces social cohesion and, and um, uh, fulfillment of, of human beings and equity. Um, support local apprentice apprenticeships, community, and, and uh, environmentally embedded holistic uh, education um, among community members. So, so you have public education. Let's support, you know, maybe we'll have some uh, community uh, events. We're having a, a, a spiritual ceremony over here. You know, everybody's invited. It's in this tradition. You know, we have another one over here. We have um, teachings about the creek, this creek over here. Um, and then wage leveling. The idea that, you know, everybody's contributing to this community. It's a, a strong uh, traditional teaching. Um, everybody should be acknowledged for their gifts. Everyone has different gifts. So if you, if you value everybody's role, then, um, um, especially through wage leveling, you know, yes, we need doctors, but we also need people who are um, cleaning up after all our food messes or 
our uh, uh, sewage messes, um, contaminants messes. Um, so here's some of the examples of, of activities that are already taking place. There's so many great, great initiatives out there, um, but they're all little pieces here and there, and they're not supported uh, in the mainstream. Um, there needs to be more political will to integrate these into to community development. Uh, the UN, they have this, the Earth Policy Institute has come up with eco-economy indicators. So if we, if we are going to have an environmentally sustainable economy, uh, we have to um, come up with some indicators. How do we measure uh, how well we're doing? So again, it's, it's a list. It's a list uh, way of looking at things. If you go on, click on each one of these, you'll see a, a whole pile of documents that, are, um, that will describe you know, what it means to, to measure population or forest cover, water resources. So these are, I think this is a, a step in the right direction. I think we need to consider social cohesion factors as well. So um, some of the indigenous principles uh, would be good to add them. So, um, you know, how many municipally controlled lands, waters, and resources do we have? Do we have inclusive rights of, of passage, justice, and decision making? Do we have these um, environmentally embedded holistic education programs? Uh, what are the suicide rates? You know, um, indigenous health. Indigenous health, I've, I keep, this in the back of my mind, but I, I see indigenous people as, as uh, an indicator people of the health of social relations on, the, on this planet, social and environmental relations on this planet. And um, you know, if we can raise the status of, of indigenous health, um, I'm pretty sure that we'll be addressing a lot of uh, issues, environmental and social issues. Um, participatory water and food facilities and activities, a sharing of food and food activities, cashless trade systems, Right now, it's, it's, uh, um, it's very difficult to do trade. Um, and um, no interest banking. Can you imagine that? <laughs> um, Eco-transportation. So, um, you know, if you're living in a community, working in a community, what kind of transportation do you need? You know, bicycles, um, you know, uh, cooperative eco-housing. There's more and more uh, intentional communities or eco-communities that are, that are being developed. So there's all these, these test cases all over the, the place. Um, and work where you live, commuting ratio. So if we can measure how many people actually live in the community um, and work in the community, um, that can tell us you know, how um, something about their transportation, something about um, you know, uh, social cohesion. And this is just one example out in, in Victoria. The, uh, near Shawnigan Lake, they have 25 acres. It's Nico Village model and they've been working on it since 1999 and they've actually cooperatively um, they've created a society and they've developed uh, land management agreements and rezoning uh, permaculture they've done created natural buildings uh, cob buildings they have alternative waste management uh, biofuels um, they have a learning institute uh, common financing so uh, their mortgages are all common um, they have, they're trying to have inclusive governance systems. So it's kind of like a, um, a contemporary version of, of indigenous community. Um, I want to go and visit with them and see what kind of, uh, um, you know, how their governance works, because that's often key. Um, they, they have an eco cooperative, so they trade, they have free trade and uh, green burial. So they took over their burials, um, of their, their community and they have a community trust. So this is just one model. There's many out there. So what happens when you, you have this kind of shift from um, you know, market-based uh, global society to a um, community-based um, you know, holistic and, and environmentally embedded? You have reduced individual and community dependency on market forces. So you have stronger uh, food security. You have stronger, um, stronger in, in all the social areas, stronger long-term relationships. Um, uh, more response ability to the environment. You increase your social capital. So, you know, if you know that you, you need somebody in this area, so then you promote somebody who has gifts in those areas to, to move into this area. Um, so you, your, your capacity is diversified. You, um, you uh, identify environmental situations. Your, your response time is very quick. You minimize human impact on the local environment. Um, 
You know, if it's in your backyard, you're going to do something about it. Uh, and of course, uh, having stronger social cohesion and, and more Im environmental responsiveness um, reduces poverty, uh, environmental health issues, unemployment, mental health issues, substance abuse, crime and insurgency. So those are just some of the local outcomes. So now I'm imagining, you know, for, you know, if, we, if this was replicated across the world, you know, we have a bottom-up network of community-based decision-making and representation. So people will come, you know, it's a slower process, uh, you know, bottom-up governance, but it's a more effective process. Um, so suddenly you have you know, people representing, okay, all these people in this region, you know, um, we had a big, huge slide here, and it's affected communities on both sides of the mountain. Um, so now we have people, we have all this capacity that's been mobilized um, to address the issue, um, and they know each other. Um, your resilience is now dependent on um, bioregional and municipal controls over food and water and lands and territories, um, your capacity contributions, your taxes. Um, Self-determination and personal development is now um, career uh, and environmentally uh, embedded holistic egalitarian um, apprenticeships uh, and community education. Your ways of knowing and being are again affirmed and um, they promote diverse earth-based holistic egalitarian principles. So environmentally protective spirituality, science and psychology. And um, I borrowed this picture. It's, a, it's one of uh, Leonardo da Vinci's collections. It's, um, he was doing measurements of uh, the flower of life and I, I thought it, it was a really good way of looking at networks, you know, in a, in a global situation. Um, so the ideal being a global lattice of locally responsive, cohesive and connected, environmentally embedded communities. So that's what I'm, I'm going to work on that and take that to, to the UN conference in Norwich in July. But I, I want to have a, a DVD have, um, of resources to back up every, everything. Uh, I need to talk to people and, and revise this. So if anyone's interested, um, please come talk to me. Thank you.